it's great to have you all here to think about uh, biological fluid dynamics, flow structure interaction. Uh, and it's particularly appropriate for this webinar, which is co-hosted by Leeds, Damped, uh, and Cambridge University Press. Tim has played a central role in all of those uh, uh, institutions, both being head of department at Leeds, head of department here in Cambridge, uh, and also being an editor at the journal uh, Fluid Mechanics. And so Tim, uh, rather than me standing up here and, and talking, I think it's time to let you uh, give us your reflections on 50 years in biological fluid dynamics. Yeah, well, it's wonderful to see so many people here, uh, so many old friends and students, as well as um, early career researchers who are, after all, the future of the field. Uh, and I gathered, as we've heard, that there's a whole lot of others uh, watching and listening. Right, now, what I'm not going to do, actually, is survey everything in biological fluid mechanics that I have been involved with. Uh, that would be very superficial, and I'd still have to talk quickly. Uh, so, uh, I won't. Um, yeah, uh, now, I came back from a postdoc in the United States um, in 1968. Uh, yeah, I came back um, and went to work in the Physiological Flow Studies Unit uh, at Imperial College, uh, which had been founded um, a couple of years before by Colin Caro, um, uh, a medic from St. Thomas's Hospital, um, who became the director of the unit and remained director until his retirement in 1991. You'll see from the note at the bottom that he's recently deceased, which is sad, uh, but he made a good score. Um, and he did, uh, he founded it in collaboration with Sir James Lighthill, who at that time was a Royal Society Research Professor at Imperial. Um, the other researchers who were there uh, are uh, listed here. They were Tony, Tony Seed and Michael Sudlow, who were medics, also from St. Thomas's, Bob Schroeter, a chemical engineer, Nigel Wood, an aeronautical engineer, and me as an applied mathematician. And James was always in the background. Uh, well, sort of, he was in the background until he came to visit, of course. Which, uh, <coughs> um, the topics that I'm going to cover today, um, are many fewer than were in the abstract, and actually are going to be significantly fewer than are listed on this slide. Um, I'm going to talk about flow and pressure drop in branch tubes with the prediction of inspiratory airway resistance, flow in collapsible and non-uniform tubes, which we've heard a certain amount about in this uh, conference. Uh, and I was hoping to have a big chunk on all the recent work, recent means after the 1980s, um, on uh, microorganism motion um, and the like, but I won't have time to do more than, if I'm lucky, uh, mention my most recent work. I'm not feeling guilty about leaving all that out. It's because uh, half the talks at this conference have been um, on that general sort of subject. So there's lots and lots of people who know more about it than I do. Um, <clears throat> now, so, um, here's a cast of the uh, human lung. Not a very good picture, I'm sorry about that. Uh, it was taken, uh, not surprisingly, it was taken post-mortem. Um, the, oops, sorry, I was pressing the wrong thing. Here we are. Um, Anyway, you, if you're lucky, you can see the main windpipe or trachea coming down here, which branches into two major branches into the, two, the major primary bronchi. And then each bronchus bifurcates into two other tubes. And each of the, sub, it, it, there's about 20 generations of bifurcations until you get to the peripheral units where the gas exchange takes place. Uh, as, and the diameter reduces each time, etc. And when I got to, oh, 
when I got to um, the PFSU, uh, my colleagues, Bob Trojan and Michael Sudlow, were already taking, try, we're trying to, I'm not used to this, am I? Not this gadget, I think I'll do it here. Uh, were making measure, hot wire measurements of airflow in a single junction. Uh, they had Poiseuille flow usually coming in, and they wanted to know what the flow was like down here. This is one junction with the area ratio and the angle very typical of the human lung. They put some smoke in near the junction and looked up the daughter tubes. And what they saw was this pair of uh, secondary vortices, or actually helices, of course. You're looking at them coming towards you. Um, which was already interesting. And the reason there are secondary motions is that these um, flow streams go around a bend. And so the faster moving fluid it, through inertial forces gets flung out to the outside of the bend and the slower moving fluid has to come around uh, to the inside. Um, and uh, because that flow impinges on the flow divider, there will be a boundary layer developing on the inside. Uh, and that will have the consequences um, uh, of the velocity profiles. Uh, here is, these are the velocity profiles in the daughter tubes. Uh, this was, this is two different Reynolds numbers, 700 and 290, uh, two different inlet conditions, the parabolic entry profile I mentioned, the flat entry profile, uh, and in the perpendicular plane, you see that there are maxima to the velocity and high wall shear stresses uh, on the walls in, in that perpendicular plane. So what you see is indeed uh, a, a narrow region uh, of very high wall shear, um, uh, which is on the flow divider and swept round to the, uh, to the side branch. Um, now we wanted to predict, be able to use those measurements somehow to predict the pressure drop because the pressure was much too difficult to measure in airflow in those circumstances. Um, Bob and Mike did their experiments not just in one generation of branches but two generations of branches, coplanar as depicted here, but uh, there was also a, a version where the second one of these daughter uh, second generation branches was in a was rotated in a perpendicular plane, and uh, the we're going to use we because we can't measure the pressure we can't use a momentum equation because whenever the walls are not parallel uh, the pressure on the on the walls will generate a longitudinal component of force which we can't estimate so we're going to do it, we did it by energy. Instead, the, the rate of the difference between the energy flux in and out of a daughter tube is given by the work done by the pressure um, at one end of minus that at the other end, the rate at which the pressure does work. And then <clears throat> any difference will be the, related to the rate at which mechanical energy is dissipated by viscosity. Uh, and putting that um, equation, that equation from words into symbols, we end up with this pressure drop equation where P hat is actually the pressure weighted by the longitudinal component of velocity uh, integrated across the cross section uh, and divided by the flow rate. Similarly for the uh, Q is the total velocity, so similarly for the kinetic energy term. And we've called the dissipation divided by flow rate we've called that delta PV, the viscous pressure drop. And this is a precise way of calculating the pressure, diff a, a measure of the pressure difference uh, uh, in the setup. And then, so we wanted to use that to um, predict pressure drop in the whole inspiratory system of 20 generations, for which there was some data on the dimensions, but that was all. Uh, but because all the, uh, most of the energy dissipation would have been in this thin boundary layer on the flow divider and around the, around the uh, tube, um, we thought we could, we might as well try scaling it with the ordinary flat plate boundary layer. In other words, 
is about their thickness uh, proportional to the longitudinal di distance in whatever tube we're talking about divided by the average velocity in that tube square root uh, so and we could work out using supposing that the axial velocity profiles were the ones that counted that the actual velocity was much greater than the transverse velocities etc um, we we took the uh, viscous pressure drop in any generation uh, divided it by the corresponding uh, pressure drop which would be there if they had positive flow which a previous uh, prediction of inspiratory pressure drop had tried uh, and um, <clears throat> we found that the for those two dimension branches two generations of branches there this ratio z was not dependent on the generation number it was the same for the first generation and the next ones it was not dependent on reynolds number uh, and depended on the uh, diameter to length ratio in whatever tube we're talking about so you know that you know what the flow rate is in each tube because we assume symmetric bifurcation of flow rate at every generation uh, so you can work out the viscous pressure drop throughout the uh, throughout the lung and uh, <coughs> the results um, well it's difficult as I say to compare with um, experiment because there are very few experiments looking at the pressure drop from the trachea to the periphery the periphery is all right you can you know about you can easily get the pressure in the chest but what you can't easily get without sticking something in is the pressure in the trachea uh, but these people must have done something like that anyway there were two um, experiments that we could compare with one was well what you can see one just gave a number and the other uh, for a given flow rate and uh, you get the pressure drop but the other one gave a linear curve uh, but, um, but anyway the point is that our model these black dots um, were at the right order of magnitude for uh, the uh, for those experiments and the predictions were not so that was quite satisfactory uh, and a few years later uh, another bunch of people, um, Slutsky and co, uh, took a rigid cast of the human airways uh, and made, um, and sort of emptied it out of its contents and made uh, uh, and measured the actual pressure drop for flow at different flow rates through that. And they plotted the results as the friction coefficient, uh, which in any, which is the pre viscous pressure drop divided by the square of the flow rate in the trachea qt and, so, and because the the friction coefficient is constant in for turbulent flow and we see that it's constant here if the tracheal pressure drop is greater than about 5000 where um, it's known that you get turbulent flow in the trachea and the leading bronchi uh, for, um, at Reynolds number is a bit greater than that actually uh, and at the very the lowest Reynolds numbers in the trachea you get a negative a slope of negative one which is equivalent to a, a linear pressure drop against flow rate and in between there's a nice range of um, Reynolds num tracheal Reynolds numbers where the slope of that against tracheal Reynolds number is minus a half which is precisely what our model says it should be which was particularly satisfying. I'm not sure the authors found it very satisfying when a referee pointed this out um, because uh, they tried to fit a curious curve uh, to that data, which didn't fit very well at all. Anyway, that's, um, uh, this was actually really very satisfactory uh, and we made a lot of mileage uh, from that result. Okay. Now the other th the next thing that was going on in the PFSU was my, my other colleagues, uh, Tony Seed and Nigel Wood, were developing a hot film anemometer, the details of which I won't go into, although I did quite a lot of work on it, um, uh, to measure the fluid, the blood velocity profile across uh, the blood vessels, in particular 
the aorta, uh, uh, that's a bit of a slightly invasive process. It could be done by MRI these days and all sorts of things. But uh, so it was done in, uh, actually done in dogs, not people. Um, uh, and um, they, that was satisfactory. They could, uh, they could actually measure the velocity profiles uh, as a, across the aorta and for some distance down the arterial tree, down into the legs, for example. Uh, the other thing that was going on was uh, Colin Caro's favorite topic, which was to, he would, he was interested in the development of atherosclerosis uh, or arterial disease. Um, and it was observed that this uh, tends to develop primarily in particular sites, not just everywhere or nowhere, depending on your health, you know, but um, it tends to form on the inside of curves when you've got a curved artery, it tends to form on the outside of a branch uh, when you've got a branch and not, not on the flow divider and things like that. And they uh, looked at this data and had a, um, a thought about, based on um, steady flow uh, in complex uh, tube geometries and realized that if, that if that was relevant at all, it meant that uh, atheroma developed at principally at sites where the wall shear stress would be small, a low wall shear stress hypothesis, which conflicted with uh, a high wall shear stress hypothesis, which had been published uh, a couple of years before uh, in the States, uh, based on the notion that it's turbulent flow at high flow rates that damages the lining of the arteries and therefore you get atheroma there. Now it's fair to say that this, um, to this day, uh, of those two hypotheses, the low shear hypothesis is the one that uh, most people believe to some extent. Uh, now Colin Caro and uh, Jim Fitzgerald, who was a student, and Bob Schroeter wrote this paper uh, in Roy Sock, uh, and they proposed the shear dependent mass transfer mechanism, uh, large molecules perhaps getting to the wall more easily uh, um, or getting out of the wall more easily at high shear regions so that, that they would accumulate uh, on, the, on the low shear regions um, based on uh, the idea of a diffusion boundary layer, which turned out to be, that's totally wrong, but, the, um, but it was quite interesting. So, and then what I, as a result of a suggestion, again, from James Lighthill, who'd seen some experiments, um, I started looking at flow and collapsible tubes. Uh, and I'll um, talk a bit about that. We've heard a bit about that uh, in this meeting, but I'll assume that not everybody is an expert, um, including me these days, Paul. But uh, so all blood, oh, rats. Um, all blood vessels um, are uh, elastic and will tend to tend towards collapse if they're squeezed. So if the internal minus external pressure, the transmural pressure is large and positive, that will tend to dis dilate or distend the, any vessel. And to change, to change the cross-sectional area, you need to stretch the walls and that can, and they're quite stiff. But if, if you reduce the transmural pressure below a critical value close to zero, the circular cross-section of the cylindrical tube will, be, will begin to buckle. And after it's buckled, to change the cross-sectional area, uh, all you need do is bend, uh, the, the, the cross section and that for fairly thin walled elastic tubes tends to be a lot easier. So you tend to get pressure area curves a bit like this. Uh, they get very stiff again when you squeeze them almost closed, um, which is uh, 
Um, that's nothing wrong with that. The, uh, this is a sort of analytical model that was that tended to be used in uh, numerical work. Um, it's not because it's uh, this. This was, you know, pure fluid mechanics. Uh, so it wasn't ex whatever Herbert might think. It wasn't expected to be precisely uh, guaranteed to be the same as experiment. This. Uh, three halves power comes from a similarity solution which i shan't bother to tell you about uh, so the standard is the standard experiment to find out how collapsible tubes behave with flow through them is to take a length of collapsible tube stretch it put it round a couple of rigid tubes at the end oh dear sorry uh and um uh and uh contain it in a chamber whose pressure can be independently controlled and push fluid through it and then measure things whatever you like the pressure at the upstream and downstream ends of the collapsible segment the cross-sectional area at the narrowest point the thing tends to get narrower as it goes along because there's a viscous pressure drop so the pressure inside will tend to fall with distance downstream uh, so it's more likely to be squeezed by the pressure outside um and the flow rate <coughs> um and so you can make a um oh and the other thing which i should definitely point out uh because um uh, is that when you do this experiment you tend to um now how do i I'm going to yeah, yeah. sorry to see oscillations develop i'm pressing the wrong button every time um the flow coming from right to left and uh, at the downstream end where it's most collapsed you tend to see oscillations now why did that stop yeah I don't know, there we are. and uh, this was these were done there's a demonstration there there, much more recently in the base yeah yeah there's some nice oscillations and if you listen carefully, you'll hear the voices of two right. familiar voices, which are uh, Good. Draga, okay, Nikola Puzovic, so uh, and um, fine. Paul Linden, who was overseeing her at this particular experiment. Anyway, yeah, uh, so you get oscillations, and um, these are some different experiments done by Chris Bertram in Australia. Uh, uh, in a rather thick wall tube and with turbulent flow in it. Uh, but the, I've shown these because these are just measurements in his setup of the pressure at the downstream end of the collapsible segment. Um, and just to show uh, how rich this dynamical system is, you get very high frequency irregular stuff, which might be a reflection of the turbulence. Uh, you get High frequent, regular high frequency oscillations, but modulated irregularly. You get more regular high frequency oscillations, and then you get slightly lower frequency oscillations. By the way, note that the the abscissa is time and it's different scale and different pictures, and the vertical is pressure uh, in uh, kilopascals. The um, so you know here's a, a regular nonlinear oscillation. Change the parameter a bit. And one in three of those collapses has gone away. So that's already period trebling. And then the, the other one goes away. And then over here's a whole lot more, which I won't go into detail. But the point is, it's a very rich dynamical system uh, crying out for um, explanation. Now, modeling, you can do a lump model where you write ordinary differential equations for the relationships between the pressures at, at the two ends and at the narrowest point and the flow rate and the cross-sectional area at the flow rate um, uh, and they give oscillations but they're too many uh, um, heuristic assumptions uh, that I'm not going to show any more about it um, and one-dimensional models are better and here's the picture a relevant picture you show you take the pressure the cross-sectional area and the velocity averaged across the cross section to be functions of x and t uh you you've got the uh the conservation mass conservation momentum where d is a viscous resistance 
the inertia term has a coefficient beta to represent the fact that, it, well, it might not be one because the velocity profile might not be flat. Um, and you've got a tube law modified by the presence of longitudinal tension, uh, where it's assumed that the uh, second derivative of the cross-sectional area is sort of related to the curvature of the, the wall in a longitudinal direction. Uh, of course, this is a three-dimensional experiment, but, uh, and that is a sort of two-dimensional approximation of the model. And there's the tube law that I pointed out before. And uh, the standard model has no energy loss, except for the viscous energy loss represented by B and has no uh, longitudinal tension. And if you start upstream somewhere where, the, where it's sufficiently distended, that the velocity is relatively small, you have a constant flow rate and you find that the rate of change of, of area with X is minus uh, this resistance term times the flow rate divided by C squared minus U squared. U is the velocity, C is the speed of propagation of small amplitude uh, pressure waves in such uh, in an elastic tube. But, and as you go downstream, you see flow rate's constant, but you, because the area is getting smaller, the velocity will get bigger, uh, and C, the wave speed, will get smaller because it's related to the slope of that tube law, which gets significantly smaller once the thing starts to collapse. Uh, and there'll be no solution after, uh, at whatever point, those two become equal. And that's choking, and it's the same phenomena, phenomenon you get with in gas dynamics and in shallow water flow. Um, you can put a, do a time-dependent model, um, the simplest of which include the, this constant tension. Uh, and we'll assume on the basis of the fact that when you've got a flow in a tube to a small area and then expansion again at the downstream end where it has to tie on to the lower, to the downstream rigid tube, uh, and that rapid expansion you will expect at high enough Reynolds numbers to lead to flow separation and significant energy loss. So we're supposing that's the main and only site of energy loss. Uh, so there's no energy loss upstream of the point of flow separation, and there is one downstream, uh, and where chi is a parameter <coughs> <coughs> representing this. Uh, if there's no energy loss, chi is one, if, there's, if chi is one all the way through the system, uh, there's no steady solution exists if the flow rate exceeds a critical value dependent on the longitudinal tension, uh, which is the same as choking when you didn't have longitudinal tension. When chi is less than one, however, there is a, some energy loss and a steady solution exists for all flow rate as long as the tension is positive. And this incidentally represents the first uh, problem that Oliver Jensen was involved in solving in his PhD. Um, and he's unfortunately committed to lots of things because they've still got teaching in some universities. It's a, difficult to believe, especially when you're retired. Um, <coughs> anyway, so he couldn't come. Uh, and you do, and from that one dimensional model, <coughs> you do get oscillations arising. This is, uh, um, one parameter, I forget which parameters changed in this case, but you get some regularish high frequency oscillations uh, go a bit further down. Uh, and uh, you get those high frequency oscillations, but modulated. And you go change the parameters some more, and it's modulated at a higher frequency. And this, um, this is the, the, the full solution of the equations. Uh, and if you look at the second row here, the others are different quantities, but the second row here is P2, the downstream pressure. This is from Chris Bertrand's experiment, and that doesn't look, I mean, it, this, this is not a proof of anything, but it looks not dissimilar uh, to uh, the model. Um, 
Okay, but again, the modeling of energy loss at the narrowest point and the uh, solid mechanics, including the longitudinal tension and everything, um, are heuristic. So it's, we prefer to next to seek a simplified configuration where a scientifically consistent theory can be developed. In other words, 2D flow. It's not easy to do experiments in 2D. You get very wet and it doesn't uh, work. Uh, but uh, it's, um, <coughs> it's <coughs> so the idea is, again, you have a rigid channel with Poisson flow coming in and uh, part of one wall is replaced by a membrane under tension. And let me see what happens. And first of all, however, what do we know about unsteady separation in a channel with a moving indentation? And at that point, we didn't know anything. So um, we, uh, I'm moving sideways now. I'm going to talk about uh, the, the work uh, uh, in an experiment uh, which was done by Kira Stefanov, who was my postdoc at that time. Uh, this is a 2D channel um, in, or approximately, I mean, obviously it's not 2D, but it's a rectangular cross section with um, a width, which is 10 times the underserved depth. And the black thing here is a thick membrane stuck to the rigid walls upstream and downstream and stuck to the top of a uh, a piston which is moved in and out, driven sinusoidally by a motor, and it's it's very stiff, so it doesn't it, that doesn't flop about or anything. Uh, <clears throat> and um, let's see what is to be seen. I hope this works. Uh, I hope it can be seen. It's not a movie, of course, from those days. So, but movies were taken. Uh, this is a case with a fairly high laminar torque sort of Reynolds number, a rather low frequency parameter, um, and an amplitude, i.e. maximum indentation, which is mm, order one, or burr, small, but not that small. And you see that this is, as time advances, it goes down. Here's the downstream end of the indentation. You get a separation region there. And a bit later on, it has developed to be a bit bigger, but you see that another one has developed on the opposite wall and the streamlines coming along are displaced so that there's a crest there. And then that crest, as time goes on, that crest propagates downstream. Uh, but also downstream of the crest, you see another a trough developing with another region of separation beneath it, and indeed another crest beyond that. So you've got a system generating some sort of wave with a phase velocity uh, of a certain magnitude, and the wave front, represented by the first time you see some disturbance, propagating more rapidly. So in other words, the group velocity of this wave, whatever it is, is greater than the phase velocity. Uh, and this is a sketch of those streamlines in case you couldn't see them very well. Uh, if you look through the window on the side wall, uh, so we're looking into a window, the opposite wall of which has that indentation in it, that, that uh, uh, here I go again. The indentation uh, is the downstream end of the indentations here. Uh, here is a representation of the first bit of flow separation on the opposite wall, uh, which, as you go on downstream, develops to uh, splits into two rather. Well, that's to do with the uh, uh, the double uh, the two uh, recirculations that you get under it, uh, and further downstream still uh, it. Um, that develops a cross stream instability, which is interesting and we've never analyzed properly. Um, but, and here you've got the next wave downstream and that split, splits into two, et cetera. <clears throat> um, so, uh, and how do we understand that wave? Well, I'm going to outline a bit of theory. If you like bits of theory, uh, you know, that's fine. If you don't, 
Um, you'll have to put up with it for a moment. Um, this is, um, we're going to assume uh, that there, th this uh, indentation, I've got it on the bottom wall here, as you see, rather than the top, has an amplitude parameter epsilon, dimensionless, uh, a longitudinal parameter, so that the length of the thing is lambda a, where a is the width of the channel, and this is not to scale, lambda we're going to assume is large, whereas epsilon we're going to assume is small. The Reynolds number is going to be assumed to be large, and in fact we're going to assume that lambda is much less than the Reynolds number, although it's large compared with one, and we're going to take, for reasons of self-consistency of the subsequent theory, uh, that epsilon is order lambda over the Reynolds number to the power one-third, and the Struhl number the frequency parameter is uh, small, and we're going to take this parameter to be order one. I won't go into details. Um, but uh, in this model, this is a sort of summary of the model. Uh, this is high Reynolds number. The core flow is going to be assumed to be inviscid, but rotational because you've got the Poiseuille flow coming in with the gradient of vorticity across the channel, which is very important. Uh, the boundary layers, viscous boundary layers are there and can be analyzed, but we're not going to. So we're, they're, they're going to be assumed to be thin with a thickness less than epsilon. And so that the, it, the cross stream pressure gradient has to be important because you've got these curved streamlines, which you want to uh, describe and explain. Uh, and to, for the cross, cross stream pressure gradient to be important, be important we're going to require lambda to be proportional to the one seventh power of the Reynolds number. So the, which, that sort of power of Reynolds number is the sort of thing we associate with uh, <coughs> interactive boundary layer theory, pioneered by, well, pioneered by various people, I think in particular of for the internal flows like this of Frank Smith, uh, who was at Imperial at that time. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, these are the two, the non-dimensional uh, 2D Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, uh, continuity, X momentum, Y momentum. Uh, these uh, are obvious, the boundary conditions. If we had viscosity, we'd keep the no-slip condition, but we're ignoring it for the core flow. Uh, and the, there's no penetration on Y equals one. And there's the kinematic boundary condition on the indentation. Uh, and you expand things in powers of the amplitude epsilon, and the leading term you get from the top two equations is that the first perturbation to the longitudinal pressure gradient is zero, uh, and that the u and v uh, have to be related to the oncoming flow velocity profile, u naught, and its gradient uh, in this way, where a of x and t is an unknown function, which actually represent minus a represents the displacement of all oncoming streamlines in the plus y direction. Uh, and then you, inter you can integrate the y, the next term, the next order term <coughs> in the y momentum equation, giving you another function of integration, the twiddles of x and t plus a constant, uh, which we want to be order one. Uh, times a function of y by, uh, given by the uh, oncoming flow velocity profile multiplied by the curvature of that displacement function. Uh, so the pressure at y equals one is this, p twiddle plus a, a constant which we're taking order one because it represents the cross stream pressure gradient times d2 over dx squared. To get any further, you have to go to the second order in the X momentum equation, but luckily you don't have to solve it. You only have to evaluate it on the two walls. So on and on Y equals one, the plane wall, it's, uh, it, it gives this relationship between the pressure gradient, the unknown pressure gradient function and the unknown displacement function. And uh, which is at the moment, non-linear, weakly non-linear, but non-linear. And you do the same thing on the indented wall, 
uh, which is a bit complicated and where, because it involves all these uh, derivatives of f and you subtract the two equations that you get there and the great pressure gradient goes out and so does the nonlinear term funnily enough <clears throat> and what you're left with is an equation which turns out to be linear a partial differential equation for a of x and t and in the region downstream of the indentation where the f function is zero this is this left hand side d3 a b d x cubed equals the constant times d a b d t which is the linearized quarter vague de Vries equation which um, supports downstream propagating waves whose group velocity is three times the phase velocity which we were which when we call them vorticity waves because it wouldn't be they wouldn't be there if the oncoming flow velocity didn't have a gradient didn't have vorticity in it uh, and if you integrate that equation with f in it uh, you get things like this 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 is a case where we've supposed that the downstream end of the indentation can be given by a tanch function and as time goes on that is pushing into the into the channel and you see that uh, the, these are the solution of the equation at this small time you get a very small little waviness downstream which you wouldn't be able to see i'm assuming that you can't see anything unless uh, a the the magnitude of a is greater than about 0 0.02 in this dimensionless uh, plot so the first thing you'll see when something gets above that is this first uh, wave, um, which I've called a B. Uh, and then a bit later on, the second wave will become visible and it looks qualitatively similar to what we've observed. And if you actually, this, uh, this is one particular run of the experiments, uh, purely by chance it's the one where the agreement with the theory is best but anyway um, the first that the dots are the measured positions of the wave crest b measured off photographs i mean my apart from originally uh giving the original sort of general design for this experiment my contribution was uh to spend a long time measuring some of the photos um uh, other, I mean, Kira did a lot, and so actually Oliver Jensen and Paul Hammerson were two uh, part two students, I think, at this time, and they did they uh, did a lot of measurement as well. And you see that for wave B, the solid curve, which is what we're really predicting in the model, agrees very well. For wave C, it's not too bad. This is the this is the uh, the circles here. They come up the uh, and they're a bit before they in the experiment they come a bit before the prediction, and wave D they come significantly before. And uh, it's pretty clear that the that that dis difference is due to the fact that we've ignored we've neglected viscosity in all that theory, and that would slow things down. So that was reasonably satisfactory as well. Um, and then let's get back to the uh, collapsible channels, um, uh, which uh, and the fully nonlinear uh, CFD computations for them were done by uh, Xiao Yu Luo, who was my uh, P uh, postdoc in when I first went to Leeds in the early nineties. I've got a picture of. I should. I would, want you to have a picture of Kira Stefanov for the earlier experiments. But these are the only pictures I'm showing of people. Uh, there are, uh, are people who have done very important experiments, or I'm very important to me. Um, uh, and um, uh, and can't be here today. Um, so it's we're going to do. She's doing CFD on the collapsible tube problem um, <clears throat> uh, nothing actually unexpected in any of that slide the uh, it's a membrane of constant 
tension in this uh, theory. Uh, difference between the external pressure and the normal stress is given by uh, the tension times the curvature, the full value of the curvature. Um, <coughs> T is a dimensionless tension, and it was solved using the finite element method. And I'll just show one or two results. The um, steady, we first of all looked at steady flow. And uh, I've drawn a little, a, an early version of the picture because I've got this one out of the paper and thought that was great, but it missed out some of the earlier, <coughs> of the, the, the larger tensions. You see, we, we, re we represent the tension as the tension, the initial tension, which is rather high, and then we divide it by a number which we call beta, uh, and then we see what happens as beta is increased or the tension reduced. And you, you go from beta equals one, the, the planar case, to uh, beta equals five, and it starts to be indented. Um, beta equals 10, it's a bit more indented, and the minimum has gone downstream a bit. Uh, and then that happened, that goes on happening, that the, the minimum, it gets more and more indented and the uh, indentation, maximum indentation moves downstream. Uh, <coughs> and then you get to beta equals 30 <coughs> when, and the next thing that happens is that the indentation stops moving further downstream as you reduce the tension. Um, it just goes, it, it just gets more closer and closer to the end, but it doesn't get more and more collapsed in the obvious sense. And upstream, it starts to bulge out. Now, you can do a linear instability theory for that. And when you do that, well, you get this. This is the minimum value of y at this cross section. It, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And then round about here, it starts to, it stops to um, collapsing. Uh, and as we know, moves downstream, though that's not measured, not but put on here. But uh, at this point, TB, I think, no, T, TU, uh, it goes unstable and oscillations develop. And incidentally, uh, if you try and reproduce the same circumstances in Oliver Jensen's uh, model, uh, you do indeed get bulging out and you do indeed get oscillations, not quite at the same uh, y min values, but uh, not too bad. Um, and these are some, they're rather old uh, pictures, but the, if you take the, uh, you measure the displacement of that, the solid curve is what we're interested in. Um, not measure, you know, plot the displacement at values of the tension, which are slightly sub-critical. You get a nice sinusoidal oscillation, suggesting that you've gone through a uh, um, supercritical hot bifurcation. Uh, and then you reduce the tension a bit more, and you've, seems to me, obviously gone through a period doubling bifurcation. I mean, they're not identical, those, the first ones are the first ones that appear. They get more identical down here. Um, and if you reduce the tension a bit more, you get much more irregular oscillations. Uh, suggesting you're on the way to chaos. Um, and the, all those were for Reynolds number of 300. And this was for the, the beta parameter of 35. Uh, so that's, that was the beginning of um, a long succession of uh, <coughs> projects that Xiaoyu has done, uh, independent of me. Uh, and got the um, got the modeling uh, <coughs> of this two D system and uh, got it taped and uh, looked at wall mass, which we heard something about uh, this morning, 
uh, as well as um, variable tension. And uh, incidentally, during that B3 was 35 case at Reynolds number 300, uh, downstream, this is time changing, uh, downstream of the what is a moving indentation, it is not all that surprising to see the development of vorticity waves. Um, now, I was, I'm aware that uh, my official time is coming to an end. I'm, I may well be taking a little bit of uh, um, latitude to extend it by a few minutes, but I'm not going to be able to describe much. Um, so a major part of my research since the late 1980s uh, has been uh, in swimming microorganisms, uh, one way or another, and it was, and thanks in particular to John Kessler, who introduced me to this sort of stuff when he was in Cambridge on sabbatical in 1984 to 5, I think. Uh, this is a picture of John who also can't be here. Uh, this was a picture taken by me at, um, in a restaurant in Tucson where he lives and used to work um, in 2018. This was his 90th birthday party in that restaurant. Uh, he's not very well now, but, uh, <clears throat> but he was obviously on pretty good form then. Um, uh, he was just, uh, he always was keen on demonstrating what microorganisms were doing. Uh, and uh, because, of course, when you got an asymmetry of a, of a, um, a breaststroke puller, you, if your um, flagella are beating one way, you'll rotate another way. And he used to do that quite well. <coughs> so the only thing I'm going to tell you a little bit about, and that's not much, is... Uh, my most recent work, which I, which has been collaborative with uh, Li Tsung in Beijing, uh, and it's the swimming behavior of a marine alga called Heterosigma akashiwa, which is uh, actually important because it is the source of um, uh, quite a lot of red tides and other toxic algal blooms. And what we're looking at and I, well, Lee had a talk remotely, which, uh, you know, I'm used to his, uh, his accent and uh, many of the audience may not be. So you may not have heard, got much out of his presentation this morning. Uh, but he was looking at a suspension of these things in <clears throat> a chamber and he was looking at their accumulation or trajectories near a vertical wall. This is going, this was to be near a horizontal wall because these things are, although they, they mainly swim with one flagellum, the other one hanging around behind them to help guide them, I suppose. Um, but they're pullers and they're bottom heavy uh, and they swim up on average. Uh, in the daytime anyway. Um, and anyway, you've got, you take a suspension of these things. You, we try and get two dimensional trajectories by having a very thin light sheet, laser sheet in the middle. Uh, and a lot of trajectories will just go through it because they're three dimensional and we don't record them. We just record the ones that remain in that light sheet. And you, what ha you get is a lot more action near the top surface, uh, because ultimately or originally because of the upswimming, the gyrotaxis. Um, <clears throat> and he's been measuring the details of the turns. They, you see, they have ra rather smooth trajectories, occasionally interrupted by a rather sharp turn. Um, and there, there are the the frequency of sharp turns is much greater near the top than uh, everywhere else. The sharp turns are the same near the boundaries uh, as in the bulk of the fluid, at least they take the same length of time. Um, the 
swimming speed uh, in a sharp turn reduces sharply and then increases again uh, wherever it is, although in the bulk it's slightly different from near the wall. Uh, the angular velocity in a sharp turn naturally increases because it's turning sharply, you know. Uh, this lot won't, won't be all that, you won't be able to interpret that. Um, <clears throat> but well, what this shows is that various things like the angular velocity and the swimming speed and the uh, rotational diffusivity all vary not only with, uh, and these are the ones near the wall, not only with distance from the wall, uh, but also with the orientation of the swimming. Um, uh, and I think I will go to this one. And then this is the probability uh, um, probability density, the probability of finding an organism uh, at a certain distance from the wall and with a certain orientation. Uh, um, and it varies strongly with orientation, and so do the, and then you integrate that with respect to theta uh, across the cross section. So this is, you get a measure of the concentration. Uh, we'll just look at this bottom right hand one because that's the top uh, 10 LC units. By the way, LC, uh, which is the, the thing it's dimensionalized, non dimensionalized with, is um, taken to be approximately 20 microns, the length of a flagellum plus half the body size. So that's 20, mi LC equals one would be 20 microns. <clears throat> and you see that the top 20 microns are taken up uh, where the concentration uh, rises from zero. Of course, the concentration is measured uh, by locating the center of mass of the body. So when you're, uh, when you're more than, when you're closer to the wall than LC, there aren't many centers of the bodies. Um, and then there's a high peak uh, in concentration uh, near, uh, at LC is approximately one, at Z over LC is a, pro a difference from uh, the, the distance from the top is one in LC units, uh, and you get this peak. Uh, if you, and the, the experiments are the black curves, which you can hardly see because they're covered up by the red ones. Um, we've done, or he's done individual based models. Uh, there's one which says, let's keep, grab, keep gyro taxis and use the um, values of the swimming speed and the angular velocity and the rotational diffusivity that you have in the bulk. You don't allow them to change as you get near the, there's no wall effect on the hydrodynamics uh, in this model. And that gives you, <clears throat> it gives you an increase of concentration with height uh, because uh, more of the cells are at the top are going up, you know, cells are on the whole swimming upwards, but it doesn't give you the big maximum here. Um, if you include everything, you get the red curve, which lies on top of the experimental curve. I mean, these are, these are individual base models uh, of the usual sort, but the swimming speed you put in there and the angular velocity of the cell you put in there, uh, and the effective diffusivity are the ones you measure. They're not coming from any hydrodynamic theory. Um, and if, if you've measured those correctly, you get the right answer for the concentration. The blue or green curve just below that is the one where you don't take account of uh, how the rotational diffusivity varies, uh, <clears throat> for example. So, uh, this raises uh, a number of questions, which is where I want to leave it. Um, why is there a wall effect up to 100 meters, 100 microns from the wall? Uh, 
um, 5LC. There is, of course, a hydrodynamic theory for how a force dipole swimmer or a stresslet swimmer, uh, <clears throat> what will be the effects of the wall on its swimming. And you get that by um, the images of the force dipole in the wall um, you, using the uh, theory which has been referred to today, the Blakelet. John Blake uh, uh, was the first uh, to <coughs> uh, solve that problem. And it's been very clearly uh, extended uh, 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 and written up by Eric Loga and at least one of his students. And it, you can find it in his new book, relatively new book. Um, but anyway, it doesn't work. For the, it doesn't describe the effects on this swimmer of the wall. It doesn't get the dependence on Z uh, right. It, it, it increases, I mean, it decreases as you go away from the wall uh, uh, more quickly than uh, the observations. And um, it doesn't have the correct theta dependence which is actually dramatic. Uh, I, I can't show you because that would require uh, arguing all, all the details, but it doesn't work. And I don't know what would. What does explain this strong um, wall dependence? Uh, and it's not only us who have this problem, although it hasn't been made explicit, but there was a paper uh, in early, uh, 2021 by Buchner and the senior uh, investigator on that project was done in Tang, who used to be in the US, but is now at the at Delft University of Technology. Uh, but they uh, were looking at the different organism, Chlamydomonas. They weren't interested in uh, the gravity effects, although I can't see why there weren't any, um, but they also had a model which agreed with their observations of concentration, uh, but they too effectively put in what they were measuring for the angular velocity and uh, rotational diffusivity and didn't, uh, uh, and then they got good agreement as well, but there's something going on that I don't understand. Maybe there are people here who do, and maybe this is a good place uh, to stop. Um, so I'm uh, clearly at a crossroads uh, in my career. Um, uh, uh, and I don't know who this Morton was. Maybe I should investigate that as part of the future project. Um, but, uh, Anyway, uh, once more, I have two thanks to say. Once thanks to all of you and all of you on Zoom uh, for listening to this and, and, the, and coming to the conference. Uh, it's been a wonderful experience. And I would like to emphasize in particular my um, vote of thanks for Yong Yun Huang, who has done a massive amount of organization to get this conference uh, off the ground. And so Yongin, I want us to thank you in particular. Sorry to have gone on too long. A quick question about the last uh, um, experiments. How, did, they, did they try with a free surface? Is it a, a hard? It's a rigid yeah. horizontal surface. So did they try with a, hmm? just an open container? <coughs> um, I don't think so. Just let's, I mean, uh, it's not open at the sides anyway. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, I think it was, it, no, it, it isn't open. It was filled carefully and then manipulated to get the bubbles out. And it was the, the, the uh, and the organisms had been um, cultured in um, in a suitable daylight cycle, 12 hours daytime, 12 hours nighttime. And this is only, what I've talked about is only for the daytime. Uh, 
these, what I've brushed under the carpet or to the bottom of the tank uh, is the fact that they do tend to swim downwards on average at night. So at the transition from day to night and night to day, you don't know quite what's going on. Uh, but, and they're very interesting organisms. I would like to do some more with them and probably will, especially if this paper gets published. Tim, on your open question, do you assume that the micro swimmers act just as they do in way away, well away from the wall when they get in close to the wall? Or does the wall inhibit their ability to swim? When they are very close to the wall, uh, um, I'll, I'll go to this one. When they're within 20 microns of the wall, we've been assuming that the, the reasons for this finding is that they've made contact with it, uh, either by crashing into it with their body or with their flagellum. Uh, we, um, <clears throat> we suppose that having, uh, they may well be affected and their swimming beat pattern may well be changed. And that could be, this is uh, something we're hypothesizing, um, um, but what can I show? Well, it's not, no, I can't show anything uh, significant. All these things, uh, the rotational diffusivity as a function of orientation, the uh, angular velocity and the swimming speed vary with orientation. Uh, um, and those variations um, clearly extend further than the 20 microns. So, but, but they, the theta, theta less than naught is up swimming, theta greater than naught is down swimming, um, and the effect is more marked perhaps the down swimmers who may have uh, who may have licked the wall, uh, but it's not absent for the up swimmers. We don't quite understand, and the the um, um, the data on um, how the angular velocity uh, changes in a sharp turn doesn't lead to any further insight, in my opinion. But I'm, uh, I'm actually sure that that is the sort of question that we are expecting <laughs> from uh, referees. You note that this isn't published, so don't take us, uh, don't take our name in vain. Which is vertical, not horizontal. And uh, in my memory is saying that distribution, when we did the experiment, crucially depends on initial conditions, how we injected the cell to the volume. Uh, dep time dependent also, because time of relaxation was very, very low on. For example, it was a height like uh, five centimeters. Yeah, you had a bigger chamber than this. Yes, yes. and. You inject at the bottom, and for example, fast run, I arrived to the top first, you know. Yeah, well, I different distribution in this case, others. in this case, the injection is from and the And it was side. never homogeneous, you know. Right. Because initial data, you just injected some well, this particular has been... position, and after you just uh, observe evolution, which is uh, changing... No, I, hours, I mean, it's, it's, a, hours, good, it's a good enough. point. Yeah, Lee, Relaxation. Lee has taken trouble to make sure that um, what happens in the bulk uh, has become effectively uniform. Uh, not so much for the swimming velocity because there's 
gravita um, yeah, geo gyrotaxis taking place. But in, the, in his presentation, uh, the, what was happening in the bulk was indeed effectively uniform. So I think he's taking care of all that, but it's a, certainly an important question and needs to be made clear. And I can't, having not actually been in Beijing looking at these experiments, um, I have to take his word for it. Tim, you look so good. I finally figured out how to adjust my Zoom picture so you were there like as if in life. But anyway, yesterday I was trying to figure out, I was showing how copepods could be considered pullers and pullers, but I actually want to know this answer. The copepod seems to accelerate to greater than 7G. They can jump yeah. through the air-sea interface. The Reynolds numbers vary between less than one to a thousand. How do they do it? Um, Jeanette, you're asking me uh, for my opinion on what was going on in your experiment. I thought you were going to. <laughs> <laughs> you're oh, asking, okay. I thought you were the going to ask me about what's going on in us. The answer is, Jeanette, that I don't know enough about how copepods uh, swim to to know how they give get an acceleration of 7g i think it's remarkable and it will certainly deserve investigation but i have no answer to your question okay if i give you all the measurements which i have will well, you, help you send me? them Jeanette? yes to my email okay okay thank you so much that's okay Jeanette yep, thank Yen. you thank Likes you so much to... thank you